Two months after a court of appeal ruling removed him as the federal lawmaker representing Adama North Senatorial District Elisha, Abo has sent a strongly worded letter to President Bola Tinubu and the National Judicial Council, NJC, to stop the elevation of Supreme Court nominee Justice Choma Wosu Iheme, the lead judge in the verdict that sacked him as senator, including that of his cousin, brother, Honorable Rufai Jingi, as a member of the House of Representatives representing Meha Mubi North, Mubi South Federal Constituency. It's a legend that she engaged in trading justice for favors and that the elevation could be a compensation for her actions. Well, we'll be taking this story later on, even as we move on to uh, the field right now where INEC has been holding several elections across the country in 26 states of the Federation. And of course, uh, we will be joined by our correspondent, uh, Emeka Monye, to actually brief us on what's going on at the moment. And I'm being told he's not yet available. All right. Meanwhile, we'll just move on to the other issues that we have talked about. Uh, we've got eight months now by the Tinubu presidency, and of course, there have been lots of talks here and there that uh, President Tinubu has been doing his best to ensure that the government of the country actually runs smoothly without any issue. And of course, there's been lots of uh, challenges facing the president, right from the issues of governance and security and all of that. And of course, we've seen some groups coming out to support the government while others are opposed to it. And at this moment, we've seen some challenges facing the government and the best ways it can offer support for uh, Nigerians is what everybody's looking at at the moment. And of course, I'm being joined in the studio right now by Ni Akinshiju, who is uh, the chairman of the independent media group that's uh, conversing support for the Tunubu presidency. Thank you so much for joining us, Ni. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much. Yes. And then, of course, I mean, we've seen lots of uh, efforts by the uh, president to ensure that there's uh, some sort of uh, uh, attempt to actually address the problems of the nation, but Nigerians are still not uh, satisfied with some of the decisions he has taken so far. Uh, but your group is coming out to actually uh, seek support for him. What exactly uh, have you been able to assess in, in the past eight months? Oh, well, I, I think uh, the proper context is to say that uh, we, we are a group of uh, uh, policy analysts. So the, the name of the group is Independent Media and Policy Initiative. Yeah. And um, as part of our responsibility, we operate in the private sector actually. We run, we run our business as a policy analyst and all that. And uh, as part of our, our responsibility, we thought we could actually look at what the president you know, had been doing. Because <clears throat> a major pl uh, plank of uh, policy analysis is uh, government decisions, government uh, business. So government businesses and government policies have a way of impacting the general economy. Yeah, so course. you cannot alienate what government is doing, in the, uh, especially as it impacts uh, private sector uh, what you call successes and achievements. So we thought uh, we, we should look at that and uh, let's be ob try to be objective as much as possible so as to be able to also advise our clients you know, on what steps to take. Um, <clears throat> it is not out of place to tell you that we have some clients that believe that uh, with what they are hearing, what they are reading, uh, is as if uh, the country is not exactly too conducive for business. And we have had some that had said, oh, we are seeing more opportunities and all that. So, uh, and the only way one could establish a trend of fact you know, in the, in the whole scenario is to conduct a policy analysis of what the president has been doing uh, since uh, May 20, uh, 2023. So, um, and our conclusion is that um, there's a remodeling and there's a need for us to understand that, that the president is conducting a remodeling of the economic space, is conducting a remodeling of even the security, the security space. Apparently, when you are conducting a remodeling, especially in a situation of stagnation, because that is what the Nigerian economic space has been over the years. Yeah, uh, I mean, we've been talking of diversifying the economy uh, for exactly, several for a years long, for a long happened. time. So it's uh, 
the character, the character of the Nigerian economy that we came by was that we survived principally um, by going through a circle of boom and bust since 1960. Uh, 1960, on, on the heave of our independence, we were driven by commodities, uh, specialization by zones, you know, regions in the, in the country, um, cocoa, granite, palm oil, and all that. So for each period, I mean, for each of those zones, uh, the, each of those regions, it was at a time that price increase, you know, is experience that we, the, the experience boom and everybody was happy, you know. Then perhaps one or two years after, the global market determines otherwise and then we experience a bust and everybody is unhappy. And we did that, you know, perhaps we had a number, I mean, those regions were also perhaps more 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 committed, more understanding of the challenges yeah, that, that, of... That, that, that's because we had a different constitution yes, then. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, but even as, um, as the, the leadership cadre is the constant now, so we can, so many years after, still track those things that they expended, that they invested the money hand on, you know. But it does not remove the fact that it was that circle of uh, boom and, and, uh, and bust. Then it became rather ridiculous when after we found the uh, crude oil you know and we became a dependent uh, <laughs> economy not just on the product that we were uh, that, that had become the mainstay of our economy but even by the people itself we now turned that product the gains of that product into a dependency for ourselves so much that we were taking the the hennies from that product and spending on, on consumption for ourselves without thinking of uh, diversifying without thinking of investing you know rechanneling the earnings from those uh, from the product into productive activities that yeah. could sustain us over a period of time so um and that had been our situation perhaps until june 2023 uh, with the coming of uh, president ebola uh, met Tinumbu. and it's obvious you know that uh, the, that stagnation can be seen in our, in our GDP figures over the years, hardly do we go past 3%. When we go past 3%, it was because oil was selling high. You know, it was not because we had uh, indicators in other sectors that were, that were driving the economy and all that. So now, uh, what we concluded was that... Uh, that from your policy yes, assessment. Yes, from our policy assessment. So okay. we now realize that uh, this president came in and decided to confront the stagnation as it were and perhaps the only way to do that was to stop remove suspend however i want to put it the fuel yeah, subsidy, subsidy regime and all of that. the and harmonize the uh, foreign exchange uh, windows as it were uh, because these uh, were sources of huge subsidy huge uh, diversion of fund we were more or less subsidizing close to 90 percent of our consumption you know without thinking of, of course, our production. So I, I think for us, we are now seeing a paradigm shift, and we are hoping that uh, we would persevere enough as a nation yeah. to, uh, to see the hand of this paradigm shift uh, from our consumption. And that perseverance is what many Nigerians yeah. don't want to hear, because over the years, Nigerians have been asked to be patient mm. with every government, and they've been patient. But Talk to us about how Nigerians are saying that President Tinubu was very quick in announcing some of these policies without even knowing what was on ground and that Nigerians are suffering based on that. If you did your assessment, did your assessment actually tell you or show you that if President Tinubu had maybe waited for like three months before making the announcement on the removal of fair subsidy or that of the harmonizing the exchange rate that maybe you would have made some gains better? Well, the, the president campaigned for more than three months. And uh, anybody that is serious-minded about contexting and had embarked on a campaign, uh, I, I think it, will, it is normal that that person would have done his homework. And in the case of Nigeria, the facts are in the marketplace, are in the environment. You don't need to go anywhere. The reality is that over the past eight years, plus this eight months, 
we've had a bust economy. We've, we've not experienced the normal boom that we used to have. Between 2001 and 2015, we had close to three, four circles of booms, you know, where prices of uh, crude oil will go up. And there uh, were times when the prices of crude oil <laughs> actually dropped. Yes, too. no, I said we yeah. had that circle. You had mm -hmm. that. We had the circle 2002. We had the circle 2005, 2006. We had the circle between 2007, 2009. We have the circle between 2010, 11, 12, 13 to 14 when it stopped. You know, so uh, we, at that period, once once we have the boom circle, everybody forgets anything. Nobody would even remind those in government that this is how we should. You know, yeah, uh, but there prepare. were attempts to actually save money until uh, some governors. I mean, no, it's not uh, hard to say. It shouldn't I mean? Uh, why are you saving for the rainy it's, day? It's, when not, we can it's share? not about governor. It is about tendency. If we had had government in place, and when I say government, I'm talking about the totality of, of government. If there had been that philosophy in place that when we earn so much, we must know how to invest for returns, either for production or for wealth creation, then it becomes a philosophy. Well, and that is what... There was also that is, the sovereign investment yes. uh, fund no, the sovereign, that The in sovereign place. investment yeah. fund that was put in place, I was a major follower of it, was after a huge debate. It was very, very big debate. Yeah, but I, it was I, I said, by the PDP I, government, no, no, not I'm the not, APC no, left no, 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 I am not against uh, 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 I am not against that. What I'm trying to say is, we could have had, with the resources we had then, we could have invested up to $5 billion instead of the $1 billion that we grudgingly invested in the, I am, it's not, this talk has nothing to do with uh, opposition or whatever. It is about the objectivity of policy deployment, you know. Right. So, the, the, the if we had had $5 billion invested in the sovereign world wealth fund then, you can imagine our situation now. We won't be talking of the base things we are talking yeah, about. Yeah, but that's why President uh, Tunubu was voted, because he has some experience Good. being an accountant yeah. and all of that. Now, talk to us why the inflation rate seems to be soaring much more higher under President Tunubu than in previous governments. And then the cost of food. I mean, you would have heard in Kano just uh, two days ago where women were protesting and saying that, look, the hunger is too much. And in other places, when President Tunubu visited Lagos, I mean, his home state some time ago, you could hear people saying, Ibing Pawao, Ibing Pawao. What exactly has President Tunubu put in place from your assessment, apart from the declaration on the national food security, uh, declaration of state of emergency, emergency of food, what exactly has President Tunubu done? And what do you, in your own assessment, think he's doing to quickly cut down on this food inflation? Uh, well, we, we know the reason for the food inflation. And of course, well, it, had, it, had, it, had, know, no, it so had its roots principally in the removal of the fuel subsidy because there is a direct linkage between uh, transportation, logistics, you know, and food mm. production and food, food availability. So um, there is a translation of that removal on, on food. And of course, uh, to some extent, uh, insecurity in some food producing basket states. But the, the truth of the matter is, if the reality was the need to remove the fuel subsidy as the bigger evil here, you know, and then to be able to calibrate things going forward to assuage whatever may be the challenges. One thing that had interested us was rather than have a situation where the federal government would just intervene directly in the production of food, you know, and, and associated uh, measures, it is it collaborated as a deliberate policy yeah. with the federal, with the state government. Either with the, uh, the commitment to 500,000 uh, uh, hectares of land that we're talking about. And for me, that is not a paper thing, especially by the fact that it is in conjunction with the state. The law of Nigeria uh, invests in the state the ownership of land. So if a federal government talks about land, without bringing or collaborating with the state, then you know that that federal government is not exactly serious with whatever it's doing. But in this case, there is a that declaration, that declarative position that this is going to be a collaboration between the state and the federal government. And we have monitored it. 
we have monitored it. The states have differently. If you if you look at if you review uh, news around agriculture from the states, you see a number of launching and all that. Jigawa did, you know, Kano had done, um, even Kwara did, and all that. So, uh, uh, but again, <laughs> we, we need time. Yeah, but for food I mean, to come to the table. Food yeah, we need, we, need, we, need, and we need people time. are saying that. This may actually affect how people perceive uh, the Tinubu-led uh, presidency. Now, talk to no, us about... Sorry, but you see, it's the perception is what we need to talk. It's, it's, it, what I'm doing now is to actually create that understanding, you know, what choice do we have? The choice, the, the, the president could take the easier route of borrowing money to import more food. But would that, would that solve our problem going forward? We'll still get to that point that we'll still have to be confronted with these challenges. Yeah, I thought uh, a part of the reason why they lifted uh, the issues of Forex on those about 14 items or so by yeah, the... 40, uh, 40, uh, 40, items. Yeah, 43 yeah. items, mm. I mean, by the CBN, mm. was to actually allow mm. for that, importation that, and all that, of that. That's private engagement. I am saying the way the... If I, if you want to design a policy for an emergency situation as it is now, you will say, okay, the, the, the government should set aside a certain percentage of its earning or go and borrow a certain amount of money and use that to import food into the country as an immediate assuage uh, provision. But that is not practical. Well, and um, people are accusing President Tinubu of not continuing with some of the policies of uh, then uh, President Buhari, like, for example, the Anchor Borrowers Program, and then, of course, the issues of uh, supporting rice farmers, you know, specialized uh, food production centers and all of that. Mm. that. That may have also contributed to the issues where we are now, that a bag of rice is being sold for close to 60,000, 58,000 at the last I found out. I, I, was, I was strong bullish on, uh, on, this, on the policy of the Anchor Borrowers Program. But afterwards, we all realized how corruption had also begotten the essence of, of that policy itself. So when you, are, when you are implementing a particular policy and you think it's not giving you the outturn that you expect, you sit back and do an investigation, reread the situation, and if there's a need to recalibrate and recouple it, you recouple it and take it back to the space. It's a, it's a good idea, but is it the, I mean, the, the CBN, should the CBN be in charge of such issue? I mean, of such program, project, for instance. That's, that's a question that needed to be asked, you know. Uh, for those of us that have been following policies, we know, as a matter of fact, that the central bank should just focus on its three pillar mandates. Yeah, and but President Tinubu has asked the CBN to do that, mm. and we can see the fluctuation of the mm. currency. No. At the moment, um, Sania Kishuju, we have the Naira exchanging for over... 1,500 Naira to a dollar. So if the CBN has been focusing on this primary role, and yet we still have the Naira soaring, then the questions are, what exactly is going on the, under the Tinubu presidency? The, the underlying determinant of a foreign exchange rate is the savings you have, known as your foreign exchange uh, reserve. So your foreign exchange reserve is first determined by that, one. Then two, the flow of foreign exchange into your economy, usually through treasury bills, bonds, and government uh, fixed uh, rate uh, foreign uh, direct income and all so. that. Foreign, foreign, foreign direct investment may be, but usually as a start off, the quick intervention is usually the portfolio investors, you know, they can quickly bring in their money, and when they want to take it out, they can take it out. But we had these historical limitations. We are the money they brought in, in the first instance before 2023 they could not exit you know uh, the the average investor wants to bring in his money and when he wants to exit he wants his own within 48 48 hours and that is why when you are bringing the money you are giving a capital importation license so that license is what you present when you're also exiting yeah, so that you can take your this exact sum, you know, plus the end dividends out of the economy. But we had breached that long before the coming of, uh, of uh, President Tinumbu. And when you do that, it sends messages across other investors across the world to say that Nigeria is not no longer committed, you know, to, rep to uh, disbursing uh, uh, exchange, I mean, uh, capital imported into the economy. So what the CBN is doing now, Another policy is to insist on clearing all those, uh, all those burden of uh, accumulated 
uh, exported, I mean, imported uh, capital. And the signal would be appropriate, you know, and we appropriately forwarded back to the global invest investors because we need that kind of intervention now. Yeah, but uh, if you go with the CBN's policy now, that looks like almost everybody who has a dollar in their domiciliary account may actually be losing it out. No, 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 no. A no, lot no. of Nigerians that, that are saying news. that that policy... That was fake news. Well, that the, was, the, hasn't the CBN actually asked no. banks to actually clear, clear up about $5 billion no. that's in their... That, that is the CBN directive on net open position okay. is different from domiciliary account. It well, has that's nothing how Nigerians to do. Actually so we are clarifying now. We are clari okay. I am not clarifying as uh, a spokesperson of CBN. Okay. I am clarifying as a person who follows and understands policy. You know, when the policy is introduced into the space, I make it my responsibility to read and understand it and dimension. So from your you know, understanding, so it's, it uh, has nothing to, to do, do with, with the domiciliary account. Oh, okay. It has to do with the banks, their books and vaults. And the belief is that the banks were actually cashing out, were profiteering from us, from the economic situation as it were. They were borrowing or bringing in or generating, however we want to uh, describe it, we, they were bringing in money, dollar, you know, and saving them in whatever form on long term, you know, so much that when a bank has, for instance, 10, 10 million dollars in its, in its board or, or in its, as reflected in its books, you expect that customers that come should be paid. I mean, should be, should be, should have, uh, should be granted yeah, access, yeah, yeah. you know, to For this, to, exactly. But the banks were not doing that. They were keeping those, this money for, in expectation of further decline in the Naira. So for when, forex speculation. For forex speculation, thank you. So when the, when the, the Naira gets to their target percentage decline, they, they, they pump the uh, flow the dollar as it were. That's profiteering. And the government, I mean, uh, the CBN now said by that policy, it is not just that you are profiteering. It is also wrong for you, looking at it from the regulatory point of view. You go and borrow money, you know, to, to speculate. And something could go wrong with that speculation. And it, it will not have an effect or impact on the health of the bank itself. So what is the bank, the CBN now said, stop this. Do not proceed with it. Do not hold foreign exchange of any sort at long on long term All or right. medium term. Well, but yeah. even the one you are going to hold in short term must not be more than 20% of your shareholders' fund. All right. Interesting perspective there. And I think a lot of Nigerians will be relieved uh, because no, the world was circulating. In fact, was there's, a, <laughs> a, there's a declaration from the federal government that nobody is touching anybody's yeah, dumb account. All, all right. However... As a policy analyst, I believe, you know, that dumb account is an aberration. Why? I am not saying that anybody cannot run his dumb account, but it is improper to have a dumb account that you can go to the black market to purchase foreign exchange and go and save. save that in, also in your account. that also accelerates okay. the pressure on. Oh. Uh, on a foreign on a foreign reserve as it were all right uh, as we try to round off this conversation uh Talking about some of the moves that Tinubu has made, politically, uh, he seems to have also been having some challenges with some of his policies. Uh, if you look at the North, they seem to say that some of the policies that he has brought in place may not be favoring them. It looks like some of the Northern Elders and all of that are up in arms. Did you, by chance, do all those analyses to understand the impact it's having on that part of the country and why some... Uh, leaders or maybe elites are uh, actually kicking against some of Tinobu's policies. Well, I, I think the major one was of the, the recent uh, issue so about re uh, relocation, relocation, you yeah. know. And uh, for me, that's not profound. I, it, it, we, we need to continue to appeal to Nigerian elites, you know, to start looking at issues broadly and uh, objectively. Uh, we, in the first instance, we should not have even captured this as a north-south thing. You know, an administrative decision was being made. You have in that place all manners of people from different tribes in Nigeria, you know, and it was going to affect everybody. It wasn't as if there were selected uh, tribe men, people from a certain ethnic group that would be affected. It was going to affect everybody. And there had been an explanation around this administrative uh, position that one, that place is crowded. 
Two, there is a need for regulators to be nearer the people they are, the, uh, the institutions they are regulating. And this, this, are, this, this, this makes sense. In fact, the embarrassment for me, because when you have an institution like the CBN conducting and uh, perhaps uh, encouraging waste like that, then you question what uh, financial management is all about. Yeah, not because, just the CBN, yeah, even the yeah, Federal Airport Authority Federal of Nigeria. Authority. So you have, so you have, yes, you know, so you have people who are supposed to wake up in their houses in the morning, come to come to work, and do whatever work they have to do, and go back home. But because of the nature of what they needed to do in terms of spatial relationship, they had to move. They have to move them to Lagos, and of course, when a worker moves out of his jurisdiction, he is paid. Well, you know? uh, those are the issues that you have to battle <laughs> with because people like Senator Ali Ndume said that it has political consequences well, for he, President he, he also, he he also not said, He also <laughs> said that uh, he's uh, advocating against that because his uh, daughter, you know, works in CBN too. And oh, we thought, okay. Yes. And oh, we, interesting. And my, uh, objectively, <laughs> mine was like, why would you, because your, th your daughter may be affected, you know, take up this gauntlet and, of course, misrepresent what the issue was all about? Well, uh, it's uh, where it's pinching him that he was speaking from. <laughs> well, just before I let you go, let's talk about uh, 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 Minister of Power, Adelabu, saying that Nigerians are not paying enough for electricity. And that is making a lot of people to be worried. And people are saying that, is it that the Tinubu government wants to introduce this issue? Don't forget, sometime mm -hmm. last, uh, last year from July, mm -hmm. uh, there were those calls here and there by NEC, and of course, stakeholders that electricity tariff will go by August, but Tinubu had to shift it aside. And what we hear is that there was the issue of electricity subsidy being paid. Now, very quickly, uh, are we thinking of uh, tasking more Nigerians to actually pay more for electricity? Is that what the talk is all about? Uh, well, from my from my reading of indications and the indicators in the uh, in the environment, I don't think that is going to be immediate. But mm. that does not remove the fact that electricity supply as of now is being subsidized subsidized to the tune of more than 1.3 uh, trillion 1.3 trillion every year you know uh, don't forget we have uh, the multi-year tariff and the agree that was an agreement between the federal government and the uh, uh, and the generators and the distributors we also need to realize the fact that on the advocacy of nigerians the electrical, I mean, the electricity supply generation and distribution have been privatized. It's, they are no, it's only transmission that is still within the purview of the federal government, you know. So the private operators would want to match costs with revenue, mm -hmm. you know. And in doing that, the federal government would have to intervene. That is why we are talking about this 1.3 trillion subsidy, as it were. Right. So we are hoping, you know, that going forward that perhaps with more efficiency, with more efficiency, there will be equilibrium in, the, in that uh, sector. Well, uh, Sani, I can show you your conclusion, actually, is that President Tunubu's uh, policies uh, since May 29 have uh, been on the right direction. Evolving. Even though evolving. They are evolving. Yeah. <laughs> even though some mm. people would disagree yeah, with you and say yeah. that the policies were not thought through because no, President Tinubu himself uh, stood on the platform just on that day and said, look, I had an inspiration it that was, I should remove it this. It was as a result of what he had been thinking, his studies and all yeah, that. It was a conclusion. People mm -hmm. said that he should have uh, studied the industries very well, the sectors very well. I am not in government. I, I, have what, <laughs> I have all my facts and figures. Uh, if right, if you have to study an economy, especially, yeah. it means that economy is a cultist economy. An economy, okay. an open economy must always be in the open space. All right, but mm. we must thank you so much, Ni uh, Kinshiju. A pleasure. He's, uh, an independent uh, media initiative uh, uh, research analyst. And of course, uh, you've been helping us to understand all the issues that have had to happen since May 29 by the Tinubu-led administration. We must thank you so much for being on the program.